what I'm going to do is uh, just sort of go over some of the things that I didn't do this morning. And I want to do it um, more or less for a, a doctrinal stand, a doctrinal teaching on what we believe about the Word of God. And I had a lot of that in my notes this morning, and some of it, uh, for time's sake, I kind of skipped over. Um, <clears throat> but um, we'll read Ephesians chapter 6, we'll have a word of prayer, and then I'll just, I'm going to go through some places in the Bible that I know that we can look at to, to, to just nail this thing down of, if we're talking about Jesus, and if we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we cannot exclude the written Word of God from what people call the living Word of God. You'll hear people say, well, I believe in the... When they don't want to deal with this translation issue, they say, well, I believe in the living Word of God. And I had a former teacher of mine, Christian pastor, Christian school teacher, that um, I was... I. I asked him, he was pastoring a church, and I asked him, you know, can I have some of your sermons maybe to put on our radio station? And, I, and he said, sure. I said, you're King James, right? He said, well, and when he said that to me, John, my, I'm just, I melted. Because he was one of the men that I looked up to in my young years. And it really, I mean, it really shook me. My wife was with me. And I'm not going to say the man's name because I love him and, and have great respect for him. So I said to him, can I give you my, my perspective on it? He said, sure, absolutely. So we parted and I'm praying, God, what do you want me to send him? I'm going to send him some DVDs, okay? God, what do you want me to send him? I don't know what to send him. And I'm praying about it, praying about it. A couple weeks later... One of the girls calls up and says, Dad, so-and-so's on the phone. And I went, man, I was supposed to send him some DVDs. And I never, got, I never got anything from the Lord on what to send him. So he calls me and he says, thank you. I said, for what? He said, God brought me back. Because I knew his dad. His dad was, if you'd have said anything but King James around his dad... He would have blasted you. And I knew his dad was solid. I knew what he was raised on. Over time, people change. And I didn't even, and I'm just going, what are you talking about? He said, I looked you up on YouTube and I watched some of your videos. And he said, that brought me back. He said, I'm, I'm King James. I got a phone with him. I bawled. I cried. And he didn't get that just because I said it's King James, buddy, or nothing else. The scriptures are what convicted him and what convinced him. And these are scriptures that he grew up on. He heard his dad preaching him. He went to a, I knew what Bible college he went to, conservative King James Bible college. But you get around people and they influence you. And they tell you things. That, and that's the kind of vexing that the devil does. It's not just hitting you with sin. He's hitting you with things that are not true. And all of a sudden now you're listening to that and you're accepting that in a, as a replacement for the Word of God. And then pretty soon now your sword is not as sharp as it used to be. The sword that you use to defend your faith and to defend yourself against the devils that attack us every day. Your sword is not as sharp as it used to be. And it's actually weaker than theirs. And you can fall in. The devil can then take you and throw you into any trap he wants. It doesn't always have to be sin. It could be false doctrine. He, but he can take you from that point and throw you anywhere he wants to. Because he's got you now. You cannot, you cannot threaten him with a sword that he knows 
I mean, if I get into, if I get into it with John and I pull out a butter knife on John, okay, I don't know, but I'm just guessing John's been in a scrap or two in his life. Couple? Okay, I haven't. So I pull a butter knife on John. John just won that fight. He's got me, okay? Because he knows that butter knife's not going to do anything to him. So let's, let's do that. Ephesians 6.11, when he said put on the whole armor of God, he meant it. And the whole armor of God, part of that armor is the sword of the Spirit, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He is a fox. He is a very wily, uh, very wise, very sneaky, very subtle agent. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, he puts these now above everything else. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation. You must be saved. If you're not saved, you're, you're, you're done for anyway. If you're not saved, you're going to hell anyway. And the devils already can control you, manipulate you, and they will use you to tear, tear other people down. And the sword of the Spirit. Notice that he said, take the helmet and the sword. He didn't say him separate. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, Father, we ask your blessings now on your Word. I pray to God that you would um, uh, feed us, that you would remind us of things, Father, that we say we know. Help us to defend the faith that you have given us. Help us to be able to do it, Father, with Scripture. Father, one thing I know about all the people, Father, that I've stood against, I know, God, that they don't have any Scripture to back up their point. Father, fill our minds with your word and let us answer the way Jesus did. Let us answer every issue with scripture and teach us, Father, how to do that. Give us a hunger for your word, a hunger to study it, to read it, to meditate on it, to memorize it, to know what this Bible says and not be in darkness any longer. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Uh, turn to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. <clears throat> I'm just going to go in some places that I know are going, to, are going to teach us issues about the Bible, things that we must know. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. And that word are is present tense. The whole sentence is present tense. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And the King James Bible is the only Translation that translates verse 7 this way. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The other translations say, You will keep us, O Lord. But that's not what it says. It's in the direct context of preserving His word. Thou shalt keep them, what? The words of the Lord. They are pure words. How did they remain pure words? God kept them pure words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. By the way, is there another verse that backs that up? What did Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And when Jesus said this, Many of his disciples left him. John chapter 6. And um, let's see here. Let me find it. He said, uh, let's pick it up in verse 62. What, if it, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He said in verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. What's he talking about? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. Then he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now measure that verse or compare that verse with the one that we have on the screen here 
in Ephesians 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and he didn't say the sword of the flesh. Sword of the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. He said it was the sword of the spirit. Jesus just said here, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If we turn back to, um, and he said in verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. And there's always going to be people that we know who call themselves Christians who do not believe that everything in the Bible has been preserved correctly, perfectly for us in this age. And I say that if it's wrong now, how can we defend ourselves against the onslaught of a growing evil? The earth and this world and devils are not getting better. They're getting worse. Sin is getting worse. This world is uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, the Bible says. It's not going to get better from here on out. It's going to get worse. And if our Bible is worse off now than it was at the beginning, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with no way to defend ourselves in any way, shape, or form. There are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And look at John 666. And believe this therefore reason. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. When they heard what? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They refused to believe it. Turn back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's very simple. The same was in the beginning with God. This is what the King James says. The Geneva Bible says it almost exactly the same way. John Wycliffe's Bible says it almost exactly that same way. And he was what, 13... Somewhere around the 1300s, 700, over 700 years that we know of for sure in English that it's saying the Word was God. God was the Word. Either way you say it, you're still saying the exact same thing. And then it says um, in verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. So was Jesus Christ the Word of God? Is the Word of God Jesus Christ? Can you, can, you, can you distinguish the two? Can you ever doctrinally distinguish one from the other? No, they're the same. Turn to 1 John. 1 John. Then I'll get into my notes. 1 John chapter 5. Let's start reading in verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is what? Truth. Where did the spirit come from? The words that Jesus said. The words that Jesus said, and Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. The Word is God. The Spirit is truth. Thy Word is truth. John 17. The next verse. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You cannot distinguish one from the other. The attribute, I learned this when they tested me to see if I could make a preacher or not. When I announced to the church, God called me to preach. The church sent me to the denomination, said, we're going we're to try to license him in six months. Six months time, they, they quizzed me, Gary. They tested me. Do, what do you believe? Do you, and I, and they asked me this question. Do you believe the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one? I said, yes, I believe that. There it is right there. The Father and the Word of God, the Bible, and the Spirit are indistinguishable from the other. The attributes of God are the exact same attributes as Jesus 
And the attributes of the Holy Spirit are the exact same attributes, biblically, as the Father and the Son. They're, they're all three eternal. They're all three the one. The, none of them contradict one from the other. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, He'll speak of me. He won't speak of anything else. He'll just speak the words that my Father gives me. I will give to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will say it for you. All three are the Word. Amen? So it makes it simple, doesn't it? So now, we learned this this morning. You can kind of follow with me. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God, the Word of God is God. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The words that I speak to you are spirit. So the word of God is quick. What does the word quick mean? Alive. It's an old English. And where we get, where, when we say do this quickly, we mean, we're, we're deriving from the original use of the word. Do it like you're alive. Not like most teenagers. Are you dead? No. Well, then act like it. That's what the word quick means. Do it quickly means do it lively, like you're alive. For the word of God is quick, meaning alive, and powerful. Is God powerful? Is Jesus powerful? He said, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Is the Holy Spirit power? Yes, you shall have power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The, as quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now here's what you'll find in the book of Proverbs about the strange woman. Proverbs says of the strange woman that her words are a two-edged sword. Does that mean that the strange woman quotes Bible verses? No, she hates Bible verses. She is the total opposite of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So what does it mean that our Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword? It means our Bible beats her every time. Our, let's look at it like this. If I'm going to reason with somebody, if I'm going to sit down with somebody and reason with them about why I believe this Bible's right. And I said this in the prayer. I've done this with several preachers, friends of mine that I went to Bible college with. One in particular I remember. He gave me all of his reasons why he didn't believe the King James could be perfect. But you know what he never did one time? Quote scripture. He never one time quoted any verse that, that gave a reason why he believed what he believed. Not one time. And I said to him, when we were all done, I said, and I called his name, I said, I love you. I know you're a good preacher. And I said, I'm not questioning your ministry or your salvation. But you're wanting me to believe something. Because you've told me, Mike, be careful, don't go too far with this. You think I already have. And I said that to him. And I said, if you can bring me two or three scriptures... Showing me that anything that you just told me is in the Bible. I will immediately believe it. There won't even be an argument. You just bring me two verses of any, anything you just tried to tell me. And I already knew what he was going to say. You just give me two or three verses. And I'll, I'll instantly believe what you have to say. And that whole week of camp, nothing. And he still hasn't. Um... Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit at sharp. Because I'm not sure that I could explain to you the difference between soul and spirit. I'm not sure I could. And the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know what that means? The Bible cannot only tell you what you have already done. The Bible can tell you what you're planning on doing. That is a book of prophecy. 
That means the Bible is powerful enough in, its, in what it says to tell you what you are guilty of planning on doing. And I'll tell you, after years of being in church work, years of being in church, growing up in church, ministering in church, spending my whole life in church, I can tell you, when a man or a woman is about ready to just drop out, backslide, the, we don't see it. The first thing that has happened is they quit reading their Bible. That's the first thing that has happened. After a while, then you won't see them in church any longer. That will happen later. But the first thing that goes is reading the Bible. Simultaneous with that, or somewhere around in that same time, they'll stop praying. They've cut off the communication lines between them and God. They are not communicating with God. God is not communicating with them because he cannot speak to them through his word. His spirit may try to reach them with things they already know. But people have a way of shutting that out. Then you won't see them in church any longer. And that's just from years of me seeing people in church and watching how things happen in their life. The church attendance, usually that's the last thing that hits. And before that's happened, they quit reading the Bible a long time ago. Okay? It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our evil heart. Revelation chapter 1. I did read this this morning, so let's read it again. This identifies Jesus. And it associates him still to this day. Um, I don't want to forget this and if I forget it it'll probably be God that says Mike don't do it but if I forget to go to 1 Corinthians 13 stop me now if we all have a sudden mind lapse and nobody remembers it then God didn't want it in here but I have a reason for wanting to go to 1 Corinthians 13 okay and I'll tell you what that reason is in a minute so I'm gonna put my Bible there at 1 Corinthians 13 Revelation chapter 1 verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. You see, John was the last man alive who heard the voice of Jesus Christ. Number one, at this time, he is the last living apostle. Every one of them are dead. Paul's dead. Peter's dead. James. Uh, all of the other apostles of the original 12, they're all dead. All of them, or most of them, we think, historically, were martyred. We know some biblically were martyred, they were killed. Others we know by way of history or tradition that says they were killed. John was the only one, from what we know, that died a natural death. He died of natural causes, even though they tried to kill him. And he's in, he's in exile, since they can't kill him, he's in exile on the Isle of Patmos. They say, we don't want him affecting anybody else. And yet, think about it. He writes this letter in the Isle of Patmos, and at some point, the letter of Revelation escapes off the Isle of Patmos and goes to the whole world. <laughs> you can't stop the Bible, okay? Even they shut up John, but the letter, once he wrote the letter, it's out there, okay? I just thought, I was, always thought that was funny, that they didn't want him having an influence outside of the Isle of Patmos. He writes the letter of Revelation down. Pff, there it goes. So he said, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and his girt, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. If you go chase that down, that voice is, it sounds like the voice in Ezekiel, if I remember right. Um, when, the, when the four cherub made the noise with their wings, it sounded like the voice of many waters as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, the Bible says. Okay? So out of his... Uh, and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth it's very important out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword 
So now we've learned. We've put this together. Hebrews tells us the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Yet it is a two-edged sword, but it's sharper than any other. It is sharper than man's reasoning. So if you offer me man's reasoning on why you believe what, what you believe, and I give you scripture, you may not like it, you may not accept it, but I've won the argument. Because the word, and this is why I tell people, give them scripture. And if scripture won't convince them, your words won't change anybody's mind on anything. It won't do it, okay? Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. This is one that I did skip this morning. In fact, no, let's don't go there yet. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to show you what I believe about... The working of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. I do believe the gifts of the Spirit are still at work and still valid. In the right form. In the right form. So if, if, if let's say Pam comes in here, we're having church and Pam stands up and says, Brother Mike, hold on a second. I have a prophecy for this church. I will very gently and kindly say, Sister Pam, no, you don't. Now, how do I know that? Because of what I'm fixing to read you, okay? Um, let's look at verse 9. Let's look at verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. During the time of Paul's writing this, there were prophets. There were people, men, who were prophesying. God was, the Holy Ghost was giving them things to say. Is that not what the Holy Ghost did on the day of Pentecost? It, the Holy Ghost gave those men words of utterance in other languages and they spoke them. Now we don't know what they said. We know what Peter said. We don't know what the rest of them said. During this time... During this time, as Paul's alive, the New Testament has not all been written yet, has it? It's still being written. So Paul is aware that, yes, there are prophecies, but they're going to fail. They're going to stop. And then it says, whether there be tongues, they shall what? Cease. In other words, what they did at Pentecost, what Cornelius' family did, when Cornelius and his family were saved and received the Holy Ghost, what they, they were the first Gentiles. What happened to them? They spoke in tongues. What did they speak? Like in the book, Peter said it was exactly what we did on the day of Pentecost. So we know for a fact that what Cornelius and his family did was speak in human languages. For a fact, we know that. Because Peter testified. Peter said, I was there. I heard it. I know they had the Holy Spirit just like we did on that day, and they spoke in the same tongues that we spoke on that day. So we know for a fact that's what happened. Okay? And Cornelius was a Gentile who spoke a Gentile tongue. When he goes out now, after him and his family are saved, he's going to go telling his family and friends what? Is he going to, he's going to give, give them Hebrew lessons first? No, he's going to tell them, this is what, this is what the Holy Ghost is telling me. And he's going to tell them that. But he said, those tongues are going to cease. And then he said, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. You had gifts of knowledge given to certain men who were receiving knowledge, divine knowledge from God, who were imparting that to people in the churches. At that time, boom. But, verse 9, Paul says, right now, we know in part. And we prophesy. How? In part. Peter writes two parts of the Bible and says, Peter says in 2 Peter, here's what I'm saying, now go read Paul. He says it, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 2 or 3. He said, go, go read our beloved Paul. Which things are hard to understand, but read them. So Peter had a part to prophesy. Paul had a part to prophesy. Jude had a part to prophesy. John had a part to prophesy. Matthew had a part. Mark had a part. Luke had a part. Who am I? James had a part. They all had a part to prophesy. 
And as they prophesied, let's write this down. That's good. Let's write this down. So then, verse 10, or verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So what happened? John, the last one of the gang, the last one of that age, A.D. 100 back to B.C. 0. For that hundred years, the church was preached to and edified and given doctrine by prophets, teachers, apostles, preachers. Okay? Then John writes the last amen to the book of Revelation. Revelation 22, 21. Amen. At that point, it's done. God, now that, that the last book has been written, and it makes its exile off the Isle of Patmos, tucked under somebody's jacket. They get through customs with it. Now, they're making copies of it. And they're sending it to the seven churches, just like Jesus told them to. And then copies are being made. And then 50 years later, translations are being made. Because now, by A.D. 100, for sure, they had every book of the New Testament written down. Now, that which is perfect is come. Once that which is perfect has come, the prophesyings, the tongues, the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, they cease. Because God's not going to give another fact. What does Revelation 22 say? If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. So you're not going to have anybody who's really saved stand up and say, uh, God's given me a word here. Can we add that to Revelation? No. We can't. Christ has already said, John's already said it, the Holy Ghost has said it, as of here, no more words. No more new prophecies. At some point, it's got it's to be done. And it was finished. So at that point now, 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come, then that which in part shall be done away. Look what he said. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I look at Paul's life. When Paul became a Christian, he put away being a Jew. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. So I believe that from the moment John wrote the book of Revelation, and it's sent to the seven churches, the Holy Ghost is done giving private prophecies to people in the churches. Because now by this time, the letters of Paul, James, John, are being written, copied out, and sent to the churches. And the churches, the Holy Ghost is showing the churches which books are right and which books are not of God. Like the Gospel of Barnabas, which is a real book. The church rejected, the real Christians rejected it. And he said, that's not, that's not God. The Gospel of Peter. There's a gospel, a real book called the Gospel of Peter. The church rejected it and said, we don't believe this. We know for a fact that Paul wrote two other letters to the Corinthian church. He wrote a total of four letters according to Scripture. He wrote two more letters to the Corinthian church, but we don't have them. They were not preserved. They're not in our Bible, and neither they, sh they should be. God did not put them in there. Does that make sense to everybody? Once he wrote Revelation, we're done with private prophecies, private this, private that. Now the gifts of the Spirit are all still at work through the Word of God. 
Because the words, they are spirit and they are life. Okay? So now, 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means. How important is it now that our Bibles be right? It's more important now. It's like God knew the internet was coming. You think that, Gary? You think God knew the internet was going to show up? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. And remember, what is called God? The Word. So the Antichrist will oppose himself above even the Bible. He will say, I am better than the Bible. I am smarter than the Bible. I am an authority over what's in this book. What's in this book is wrong. You listen to me and what I say. Lisa, was I not guilty of that when I was at Richwoods? I was guilty of it. And part of while I was here. So he said, he, he, so that he is God... Sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And I'm telling you, the word cannot abide in your heart and the Antichrist at the same time. One of them's leaving. You want to get the spirit of Antichrist far away from you? Put the word of God in there. He, he will not, he cannot. Light, darkness cannot abide where light exists. Can it? It's not possible. So he said, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, how do we know Paul told him these things? Because he just said it. He wrote it down. And what did he say to them? Exactly what he wrote here. So we know now what he said to that church. And he said, and now, verse 6, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his what? His eyelashes, spirit of his toenails, the spirit of his mouth. And what is the spirit of his mouth? We just read it in Revelation 1, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So now, Revelation 19, this is his coming. This is, this is him winning the battle of Armageddon. And he only needs one stroke to do it. Which means never play golf with God. Because God can win all 18 holes one stroke. He'll hit that ball and it'll bounce in the first cup, second cup, third cup. That's how I do it. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. I love the horse. I've never ridden a horse, but I love him. God chose the horse out of all the creatures that he made. He chose the horse to come back on. Think about that for a while. Whatever you know about horses... You know why? Horses are not afraid in the day of battle. They won't turn around and run back. He said, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Now, he's also called the word of God. So, is, is the word of God, did it used to be faithful and true? According to this, it still is Faithful and true. And it will continue to be faithful and true when Jesus comes back at the battle of Armageddon. Whew. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. John saw that. And on his head were many crowns. That's the ones we gave him. It's the ones that we earned and we cast his crowns at his feet. He had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. You could say the Holy Bible. 
because they are not separate. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We know who that is. That's the saints. Because the fine linen, white and clean is the righteousness of the saints. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he, shall, he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So here again, it seems like every time we see Jesus, he is the word of God. He has a sword coming out of his mouth. John said it. He says it here. It says that the word is God in John chapter 1 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So are we talking about the man Jesus or the book? Yes. Both of them the exact same thing. Revelation 19 verse 20. The beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It, why does it have to... This is now the third time in Revelation. Revelation 1, Revelation 19, and Revelation 19. Third time now that we see Jesus and the sword is proceeding out of his mouth. It's telling you that the sword is the Bible which proceeded right out of the mouth of God. And there is no difference whatsoever. Cannot be a difference. So we learned about the flaming sword and what it's there for. It's to keep, keep the way of the tree of life. It's to keep the enemies away. Show the sword to your enemies. Show the sword to your enemies. Amen. Um, look at this verse. Luke eleven twenty one. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. There's a gun within reach of me when I go to bed at night. Don't come to my house at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay? The dogs will wake me up. No, the dogs will wake my wife up. She'll wake me up. Okay? Now, I don't like to keep a gun next to me. I don't like that. But I keep one there. Why? Because do I know when the thief is going to show up to my house? He'll never tell. But if I'm there and my wife's there, I'm not putting her life in danger and let her be killed. I know a pastor, he pastored a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The church parsonage was right next to the church. He's shaking hands, his wife left, went home. The pastor's shaking everybody's hands, pretty good sized church, Free Will Baptist Church. When he walked into the kitchen, he saw the armed gunman holding his wife. And they molested her in front of him. And he was unable to stop them. And they got away. And, I, and I, I knew the preacher. I knew the guy. But when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. You believe your Bible? Now turn to Judges. No, turn to, um, turn to Psalm 149. I'm going to quit right here. Psalm 149. Let's turn it. We'll read the whole psalm. It's only nine verses. 
the last five verses I'm going to concentrate on, but it says, Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. That means don't sing ACDC anymore. And his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. And let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. Now look at this. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Does God know who his people are? He will beautify the meek with salvation. That means he makes ugly people pretty. Aren't you glad? Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Why, Gary? And why did I just announce live on the air that I have a gun within reach of me when I go to bed at night? It's in case anybody's listening who might plan some form of harm to come to my house. Now, if you come to this church and do it, we're still covered in this church. I'm not going to tell you all where, but we're covered. Okay? Do we need to be in this age? You better believe it. You better believe it. Now, in the spiritual aspect of it, since they're not afraid of bullets and knives and BB guns, we need a sharp two-edged sword in our hand. And God lets us have one. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and, I'll, add, I'll say it like this, let a two-edged sword in their hand. Why? So we can defend ourselves. And the devils who see that are not going to mess with you. Amen. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Now, that's not for now. But it's going to be. We just read it in Revelation 19. Jesus is not coming by himself. He's coming with his saints in fine linen, white and clean. And all of us with Christ are going to execute judgment upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. And for a thousand years, doctrinally, we are going to reign and sit on thrones around this earth and rule over this earth. And we will administer the judgment of God on this earth. Perfectly. Because we'll be in glorified perfect bodies that won't hunger, that won't thirst. And if you offer us money, we'll go, what is that? Pavement? That's nothing. You ought to see my house. Amen? To execute vengeance upon the heathen, punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. It is not just a right. I mean, I have... On this verse, I have a picture of a Marine. Now to me, J.R., the Marine uniform is the prettiest, most amazing uniform any of our armed forces have. When I walked into my uncle's funeral, 96-year-old World War II, Japanese island, jack-killing Marine, they had him in full dress uniform with the cap in his hand like that. And I lost it. I bawled. I'd never seen him in his Marine uniform. Still fit. That did it for me. And you know, every one of these guys that I've said, thank you for serving your country, none of them said, I hate this country. 
I hated the military. Well, what are you wearing a cap for? Every one of them said it was an honor, and I'd do it again. It is not only a right that we have to bear the sword. It is an honor. It is an honor to carry this Bible with us wherever we go. Don't be ashamed of it. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Father, feed us. Help us understand doctrinally. Help us understand, Lord, from your word, why this book is right, why we still believe it, why we still hold on to it. And help us, dear God, to use these things that you have given us tonight to be able to defend ourselves as we stand with the sword in our hand. Just as the, the good Americans can stand on the Constitution and say, I have a right to keep and bear arms. Father, your saints have a right, a duty, and an honor to bear the sword that you give us. Thank you, God, for giving us that honor. Bless us, Father, and help us to never be ashamed of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And yes, when I was in high school, and I, I don't talk about this much, God convicted me. I heard a preacher preach it in a sermon. And I was going to Festus Public High School, and I started carrying a Bible in my books, my school books. And whatever class I went to, I carried the textbook for that class and a Bible to that class. And I got asked why I was doing that. I said, because I believe this book. I didn't brag, I didn't wave it in people's face and you're an idiot, you're a heathen. Okay? But it's what I, God convicted me about it. I think it was when I was a junior in high school. And when I carried my books in school, I had a Bible with me. Don't be ashamed of it. Amen?